This is the Average to Savage podcast with Paul Garino. Everyone and anyone, athletes, celebs, and much more. Today's episode is brought to you by BUSR.com. You know, everyone always asks me where they should bet, and now I got a solution for them. BUSR.com slash Paul. You deposit $100, they'll match your $100 in free bets, so you basically get $200. Go check it out. BUSR.com slash Paul. What's up, everybody? I'm back for another episode of the Average Savage Podcast. Our special guest today is Adam Greenberg. Adam, how's it going? Doing awesome, man. How you doing? Good. Good to see you. I haven't talked to you in a minute. Uh, oh, good to see you too. <laughs> appreciate you coming on. Um, let's just go. Let's just go back in time. Uh, when was the first time you remember just like playing baseball? Ah, oh, first time I remember playing baseball probably like five or six years old. Um, I had a glove that was like this big. They called me Hoover, uh, Hoover the vacuum cleaner because I wanted to be like Don Mattingly playing first base and I was like this big. <laughs> um, but man, I just, little league fields and that was, uh, that was it. It was just, it was just awesome. Yeah. Now growing up in Connecticut, obviously, you know, I'm from Connecticut too. Uh, what, what was it like just the baseball atmosphere and just like uh, your just upbringing? Baseball atmosphere wasn't very good. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I mean, yeah. Northeast, it was, it's soccer, it's basketball, um, football. Baseball was not really a, a huge to do. Little League, you know, it was, it was kind of something, but uh, at least in Guilford, where I grew up, by the time people got to seventh and eighth grade, they're starting to look at lacrosse and be like, yeah, this is more fun. Um, but I mean, it, it was just something that I was drawn to. I grew up watching major league baseball and that I could see myself playing and I just wanted to, I wanted to be a part of it. So I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then what about like, when did, when did you know you were like, kind of like better than the rest? Uh, I, I would say on, on a certain level, it was when I was 13 years old. Um, you know, I played baseball, basketball, and soccer growing up. So I was always one of the better kids. Mm -hmm. in you know on on all of my teams but it's one thing to be good locally and it's another yeah. thing to be good and to see what else is out there right mm -hmm. um and travel ball is different nowadays than it once yeah. was right um so i went to the i was on the first connecticut aau team which sounds crazy because there's one <laughs> yeah. but 1994 was the first connecticut aau team and made the team so i was one of the guys in the state Right. So now I'm like, OK, I'm, I'm one of the best guys in the state. And then we went off to the national championship in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, Field of Dreams. And we won when I, I don't know if it was 11 and 0 or whatever, 12 and 0 won the national championship. And I made the all tournament team to me. Whether it was right or wrong, I kind of started thinking in myself of, man, I'm one of the best in the country. Right. And I'm I made the all tournament team against all these all these guys. Um, maybe it was just a little bit of, you know, pat myself in the back and kind of I always wanted to be a major leaguer. So now I'm starting to convince my mind that I can compete at that level. But it was it was 13 years old that that summer it was like, I'm going for it. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Just like every, you know, I interview obviously a lot of athletes and stuff. It's just like so crazy to me when like people say like that young, they knew something was like, it's just like, I don't know. It's like crazy to me because when I was 13, I was probably just like not thinking like that. That's all I know. Like not, not even like that mental, like mentally it's, that's like crazy to me. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. it's with sports, right. We're watching yeah. it as young as we are. So mm -hmm. You know, you, you see something and then you either want to be like that or want to be a part of it. I mean, music, mm -hmm. the same, it's all the same, right? You aspire yeah. to be something that you're watching and when you're young. So if you're put in that environment and you want to be there, then that's just how, for me at least, that's how it stacked up. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I know you're a multi, multi sport athlete, like you mentioned. Uh, what, what was your recruiting process like out of high school? <sighs> Uh, I got more looks when I was younger, like in the early stages of high school for soccer. Um, mm -hmm. And then baseball, I went to, what was it? A couple different showcases, uh, team one and area code games back in the day, which was like the ones. Now, yeah. once again, it's like perfect game, this, that, like there's 
you could go to a showcase every other weekend. Um, that's like the biggest and the best and everyone's bigger and better. Um, so I did those two showcases. And then when I, when I got home from those, uh, the, the recruiting period opened. And I'll never forget, it was, I think it was 6 a.m. the day that the recruiting period opened, meaning the coaches were allowed to contact the player. Mm -hmm. um, and Yale was the first school to call. 6 a.m. My phone rang. I'm like, man, this is cool. And then the whole day, it was just like call after call after call. And I had all, you know, a bunch of letters that I received and I, I stored all of the letters. I put them in, uh, you know, this big folder and I, st I still have it somewhere. Um, but it was, it was the most exciting time of my life because yeah. I didn't know exactly which school I wanted to play at. I just knew I wanted to play at the best school academically and athletically as I could where being from Connecticut, nobody mm -hmm. cared about baseball, you know, I, I could have gone. And at the time, I'm not downplaying Northeast schools by any means. At the time, they weren't at the level they're at today. Yeah. So I had to, my opinion, go down to down south or out west to a baseball school, because if I play well there, there's less questions than, oh, you know, you just you're doing well yeah. up in Connecticut. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. Was there so was there any chance that you were going to play soccer in college or no? Are you were selling uh, baseball? Okay. In the recruiting <laughs> process, no. I, I shut everyone down right in the beginning. I'm like, I'm playing baseball. I'm playing baseball. Gotcha. And then when I went to UNC, I got hurt after my freshman year. And I went in during the fall. The soccer coach had asked me to play soccer. And I went into the coach's office, Coach Fox, and I said, hey, you know, I can't really do anything. My, my hand is in a cast. Um, would you be okay if I played soccer for the fall just to be active, right? Yeah. And he goes, yeah, shut the door on your way out. <laughs> so uh, that didn't go over too well. And that year, UNC <laughs> Chapel Hill won the national championship for soccer. Dang, that's, that's crazy. So missed it, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's oh, – I mean, nowadays, I mean, you, I've seen – you know, you've seen kind of more players play different. Obviously, they're in the same season, but – or, yeah, are they? No. Are no, they soccer was in the fall. No, soccer was in the, in the fall. fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, you've seen it, like, nowadays, like, other – play a lot of football players kind of – not a lot of – but football players usually kind of play baseball in college. Like, I could think of, like, Jameis Winston and Russell mm -hmm. Wilson and things like that, that, that teams let them play multiple sports um, during their college yeah, career. So, yeah, that would have been cool. The big difference was those guys did it coming into school, right? So they yeah. Yeah, they were yeah. recruited two ways. I yeah. wasn't. So when I became, we'll call it property of the baseball team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> coach is like, now nah, wait, you were the rookie of the year. You almost hit 400. You led the team and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to let you go play. Uh-uh. <laughs> you know, that was his logic. No chance. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Now going back to picking UNC, what, what were you like, uh, like your final three schools? So... It was actually um, Cal Berkeley um, was one. Nebraska was another. UNC, just trying to think. Of, so my official visits were Arizona State, Cal Berkeley, uh, Nebraska, UNC. And then my fifth one, I was possibly going to go take a trip down to Wake Forest, not necessarily as an official, but as an unofficial. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted as much variety as I could. I didn't want... Yeah bunch of schools in a specific area and be like, all right, that's the one. So in the demographics, you look, it's like West, Southwest, yeah. California, and New England schools, I kind of knew once again, I wasn't really gonna gonna look there. Um, mm -hmm. And then and then Chapel Hill came up and I really didn't know enough about the school. And after those other three visits and a couple unofficials other places, I went down there walked on campus, met some of the guys. And I was like, this is, this is the place. I mean, it just, it felt more like home. It was like, it, forget closer proximity, but it just felt like I could, I could be a big part of that program. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Now you had a great career there. Um, what, what was your experience like there on and off the field? Uh, it was awesome. I mean, it was primarily, I, I was there, um, 
my major was baseball, my minor was baseball, and <laughs> I attended class. Just like, and I don't, I don't hide from it at all. I, I had one goal and objective, and that was to play major league baseball. Yeah. Um, I did well at school. It was a challenging school. I'll say that. Um, you know, the, the courses were tough. The teachers didn't care. You know, yeah. At least the teachers that I had, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we didn't get the answers to stuff. Like we we had to work, and it was it was a grind. Mm -hmm. But that's I mean that's good. You know, doing multiple things and making sure you hold your responsibilities and also keep your your focus where it, where it needs to be, kind of twofold. Because I was a student athlete, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, it was great. I mean, the school was awesome. The the, the people were were tremendous. Um, obviously, sports down there are second to none facilities continue yeah. you know, they were good when i was there they got better while i was there and now they're forget it whole nother whole nother world um yeah. but yeah i mean i would do it all over again and and i would pick it and go there and and enjoy my time yeah yeah for sure now i gotta ask you did did you ever get to meet michael jordan uh no never did no was he like ever on campus when you there? what's that no i was saying like was he ever on like campus while you were there or you don't know uh he opened uh 23 uh yeah. the restaurant down there on franklin street so yeah. i heard he was there at different times but i never i never crossed paths with him gotcha and then yeah just like your team in general like at unc you guys had i think like three or four major leaguers to make it i don't know how many draft picks probably a ton more uh what, what was that like just to like just be drafted and things like that with your teammates um it was it was awesome because we all share once you get to that level most of the guys share a similar aspiration right to, yeah. to make it to the big league so the key for the hard part for a coach right you're, you're juggling school you're juggling personalities you're juggling who is you know prospect or not um it, so it's a it, it's a tough thing but once again as at any level the elite start to rise, right? Even at that, you know, where everyone's still super talented, but then you start seeing certain guys like really start to accelerate. Um, so just being around that environment from day one where I was playing with first round guys and the first, my freshman year, I think we had like nine guys drafted um, first round, second round, third round, whatever that, whatever it was. So that was now starting to be normal. Right where in my mind, that's what that's what we're playing. Who, who I'm playing with? These are my teammates. Yeah. Um, and then I just wanted to be, I wanted to be a part. I wanted to be one of those guys. So it was, it was inspiring and challenging at the same time because you always have to keep up your game um, and constantly improve. So because you know these are the guys that are going on, and if this is kind of some of the best of the best, you better pick it up. So it was, it was, yeah. it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then what about what, like your decision to leave after junior year, was that like a hard decision or like an easy decision for you? Um, it was initially easy and then got hard for about a half a minute. And what I, what I mean by that is I was gone. Yeah. Like, like I said, third, my junior year, as things started to go and I was playing well, um, I had a great freshman year. I got hurt. So my sophomore year was a little down, but then by my junior year, I kind of felt like I put everything out there from average defense, power numbers, stolen bases on base. Like I didn't feel like there was anything left that I could do to necessarily better my draft position. Um, and then you lose leverage going back to school for your senior year. Um, but so the only kind of question mark for me was when I got drafted in the ninth round, it wasn't the first, second or third round. So I had to think about that. I was told the Cubs weren't, wasn't a team that wanted to pick me or I wasn't a good fit for them. So I had to think about that. Um, and then the last thing was, I think coach coach's last plea was, you know, you could break almost every record at UNC offensively if you come back to school. So I had to think about that. Um, and that's what I'm saying. Like those individual selfish things weren't big enough. If he, if I knew that we had a team that was going to, you know, uh, Omaha, for yeah. instance, that would have been a much more 
thought out kind of process because now I'm weighing is is the Cubs the best team for me? You know, yeah. all those things and all those uh, all those variables, like they would become, we'll call it more impactful. But we we weren't going to Omaha yet, right? It wasn't yeah. this. Um, but uh, but I, I'm I'm glad. And the reason why I said I didn't care about the Cubs not liking or wanting somebody like me. You got 30 teams. You got to play no matter what. You got to perform. So as long as you give me a jersey. The glove, cleats, the bat, and I can go out and play. I had to earn it no matter where I went. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then um, yeah, just going to the minor leagues. Um, you moved up pretty much like every year that you were playing. Um, what what was just like I know even back back then it was probably even worse, just like, you know, I know like there's a lot of things going on with the minor leagues now and just like the pay and the travel and things like that and hotel stay. And like what was your experience uh down there? Uh, it was awesome and horrible at the same time. <laughs> I mean, yeah. make it 850 bucks a month, five month pay scale. I used to explain them like, go to McDonald's and get a job if you want to make any money. Right. Yeah. It's, 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 you're, po- you're in poverty, literally living in poverty with what we were making. And there's no time to get another job. There's nothing else you could do. Yeah. Um, bus rides were terrible. Living arrangements were terrible, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, not the lap of luxury that you'd be like, oh, I'm a pro, I'm a pro baseball player. It was awful, but amazing because that's what I wanted to do. So yeah. that none of that stuff mattered and played in at all. It was playing ball. I'm playing pro ball. And it was just getting that much closer to the big leagues that none of it, it didn't make a difference. Yeah, for sure. What about, was it, was there like a, was it like a weird dynamic because like there's some guys that are like instant millionaires that were like first round or second round picks that were on the team? Like, was that like a, was there like an ego thing or like, was it like strange to, you know, be like that playing with people like that? No, not strange. It's just like, all right, you're, we're going in your Escalade. We're going in, (laughs) you you might pick up the the bill or, you know, whatever, but no, never strange. It was only the same thing where I've got to be better than. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what first round is. I know what a first round center fielder looks like in their eyes. I know how he's yeah. performing. You're my teammate, but I got to beat you. Right. Yeah. And that's this. I'll say that's the strangest dynamic yeah, yeah, yeah. where you're constantly in competition with your teammate at any sport, at any level, but you have to play together and want to win because the winning team gets more mm-hmm. attention anyway. And you're, game gets elevated when other people are doing well. So, you know, if, if that, I say that's more of the strange dynamic than yeah. he got more money than me because yeah. in life, he got more money. This yeah. one got more money. This got a bigger house, whatever, who cares? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then what about, tell me like your call up story. So call up story. I went to the field in, um, we were in Sevierville, Tennessee, and I went to the field and me and Matt Merton walked in and, the our names weren't on the lineup card and we both looked at each other like what the hell's going on coach called us into his office and he was a total d-bag like at, treating us like you know guys you were like he made up all this nonsense like you were late or whatever you, you need to uh, tuck your shirt in or you know, whatever like the <laughs> stupidest thing and we're like looking yeah. at each other we're not in the lineup and what like what is this all about so we didn't we didn't play that day uh, we never made it in the game either. And at the end of the game, he called us in the office. He's like, Hey guys, I was just kind of messing with you. Um, you're going to stay behind. We're going to take a 13 hour bus ride to Jacksonville, Florida. And you're either going to fly to meet us in Florida, or you're going to go up to AAA. So Matt and I looked at each other like, all right, see ya. We're not going on the bus. Great. Like yeah. that was the best part of the whole thing. Going to AAA would have been great, obviously, but um, so we're we're watching the game. Cubs are playing. Because we had an early game. Cubs are playing uh, Atlanta for a doubleheader, uh, and I got a call from my agent, who mutually represented me and Matt Merton, uh, another outfielder. And he's like, "Hey, man, root against the Cubs harder than you've ever root against the Cubs." And I'm like, well, "I didn't grow up a Cubs fan, so I don't care." Sure, like, <laughs> yeah, I'm playing for the organization, but you know, you you're you don't have allegiance yet right it it didn't sink in yet so um we're rooting against them and 
Uh, eighth inning, Jeff Francoeur comes up, who was young. He was a rookie at that time. We had just played against him. He got called up. He had a go-ahead home run in the eighth, and then they, they closed it out in the ninth, and they swept the doubleheader. So the Cubs were on like an eight or nine game losing streak. Matt and I are high five and we're hugging. We don't even know what the hell we're excited about. <laughs> so soon after the game, we get a phone call from the, uh, our, our manager who was driving down to Florida. And he's like, listen, uh, I just want to let you know uh, you're not going to be meeting the team down in Florida. You're not going to be busing. You're going to fly down to Miami and you're going to meet the team down in Miami. Now they were going to Jacksonville and he says, Miami. And I'm just like, wait, what, like what's in Miami? And he's like, you guys are going to the big leagues. So that was life changing. Then we turned on baseball tonight and Peter Gammons on there talking about Matt and I, and it was, it was a special, special moment because, and I always talk about it this way, your teammates you're always fighting against to some degree, but you're a teammate. When somebody gets called up, you're like, yeah, I'm happy for you, but it's not me. Right. And anyone that says otherwise, they're lying. Like yeah. you're not playing where you're like, oh, I'm so much more happy that you made it to the big leagues than me. Right. No, yeah. that's a lot. So uh, so Matt and I got to share that moment together at the same time and be mutually happy for each other because we're yeah. both going. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, was that was that was the, the most special part of the whole thing. And that, that had to be crazy because you guys both played the outfield. No kidding. Yeah. Two, two <laughs> yeah, rookies two, from double A yeah. going to the big leagues together. Yeah. It was yeah. Nuts. And then what, yeah. What was like, just like, even just like your first experience, just getting like getting to the stadium and like, you seeing your locker and things like that. Priceless. Yeah. I mean, not, not much more to say other than we got there early, stepped on the field, looked out there, you know, no, no fans are there. Nobody's out. Yeah. And it's like, we, we did it. Like yeah. we're here. Now going to the locker room, seeing your name, signing the signing that contract, getting a wad of cash for meal money. You're like, damn, this is more than I made all <laughs> all month last month, and it's in, yeah. this is my meal money. You're like, this yeah. this can get fun, but more more importantly than anything, it was it's time to go to work. It's time yeah. to take all the work and all the sacrifice and everything we went through, and now go out and perform. Yeah. All right. So I gotta tell you, I finally finished your book after like three years <laughs> yeah, so, I've, so, so i finally read it uh obviously i think a lot of people know about the first at bat and um so after after you get hit and things like that uh what like say like take me through that next like week or like month uh it was very challenging um mm -hmm. because i didn't know what was wrong with me like i mm -hmm. got I, I had issues, right? My vision was all jacked up. My eyes would shift uncontrollably. I have excruciating headaches. Couldn't necessarily figure out what was wrong. Um, and I was being treated like, what's wrong? You know what I mean? Like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. So that started to weigh on me because it's like the last thing in the world that I want is to not be on the field. Yeah. Especially when I'm watching guys get... Uh, traded for outfielders coming on like it was it was we'll call it traumatic to say the least mm -hmm. uh jerry hairston started he went from second base he moved out to center field and i'm just i'm watching all this unfold going is, is my window closing like mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm there i get a hit i'm like that's my thought process and then when i got sent down ultimately because they're like well you're not healthy so you got to go down um it was really really tough really tough yeah and then I couldn't quite figure out once again, what was wrong. So all these issues kept coming back day after day after day. Um, and it got to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I literally told the coach and the coaching staff, I'm like, I can't, I can't play. I mean, and, and we had it out, the coach and I, because same coach that called me up or the manager that called me to wish me luck and congratulations. I'm going to the big leagues. He, he thought that, um, I was making it up, like making up my symptoms and, and stuff because you, I didn't have a cast or a neck brace or anything. So it was non-visual. I looked totally fine. Yeah. So it, it's, it weighed on me pretty heavily. Um, and I was wondering, is the quality of my life going to ever get back and got to the point where I forgot forgetting even baseball. And that yeah. was the first time in my life that I ever had that thought. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then what, like, how was it, 
like how long was it until you got back on the field? Like a year? 21 days. Oh, 21 days. 21 days, and that was the problem. Oh, because you were so oh gotcha. Because you back, went back to the minor league. Okay, yeah, and I li- and I basically lied about I'm healthy because mm-hmm. I knew I had to be back on the field. If I'm not playing, then I'm yeah. my career is going by the wayside. So I sat and slept in a neck brace sitting up for 72 hours. So like 72 hours symptom free, you can go back and play. Mm-hmm. So after, well, whatever, 18 days, and then I do the neck brace thing and then I go and I touch my toes and I do a couple of jogs and I hit a couple of balls. Um, I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And they sent me to double A. The, the, after my first game, I woke up in the morning, rolled over in bed and all my symptoms came back. So I rushed, got off the roster. They took me off the big league roster. Like it was, it was like, boom, boom, boom. Like one thing after another. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, just going into the, like the following seasons, like, um, like I know, you, I know you went through like a, a lot of different tests and things like that. And then like, so what, when did you feel like yourself again? I'd say like, what year was it? 2000. Six, seven, 2007, I started feeling really good. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was doing the vision training. Uh, I started doing vision training with visual edge performance uh, trainer uh, with the Royals in the spring and then had a really good spring. And then for the most part had a very good, it was call it a rebound year. Power Mm -hmm. numbers were up um average was certainly up on base was way up and so i had i had a good year and even in spring training buddy bell who was the manager at the time he pulled me aside he's like listen you keep playing like this you're going to be in the big leagues with us so had the good year came back with the royals and of course like not soon after i signed buddy bell resigned so got a new manager in and that kind of it was just one thing after the other over the next few years that yeah. were challenging, to say the least. Yeah, for sure. Now, I know it wasn't glamorous, but you got to play for the Bridgeport Bluefish, uh, which is a hometown. hometown. Uh, yeah. So what, what was it like just to play uh, just in Connecticut? Uh, it was awesome. I mean, uh, for those reasons, like yeah. I was a pro playing in Connecticut back home, and I was always so far away from everyone. No one ever really saw me. The unfortunate part is they didn't see me at the level that I was accustomed to playing at, but nonetheless, it was, it was a really good experience and it gave me the opportunity just to keep playing, whether I was good or bad, I got to keep playing and keep pursuing my dream. Yeah. And didn't you get, you got to, didn't you get to play with your brother like one season? Yeah. 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 Sam, uh, Sam got to join the team. I, uh, so that was an amazing experience because we were, you know, I was so much older than him that yeah. never in high school or nothing. So we, we got to play together as, as professionals. That was great. I got to face Valerio De Los Santos, the guy that hit me in the head. So yeah. got a hit off of him. I mean, there was, there was a lot of cool moments that I got to experience there. Yeah, for sure. Isn't it crazy that they like tore it down now? The stadium uh, or, or they re whatever they did to it. I don't even know what they did. But There's like a big thing over in something. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. So, so random. Sad to see uh, that. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, just tell me about how the campaign started for the one at bat. I believe his name was Matt that started it. Yeah. Matt Liston called me up in the off season of going in 2012. And he's just a baseball fanatic, Cubs fan, knew my story, um, was watching Field of Dreams with his wife. And his wife was like, man, I feel bad for that Moonlight Graham guy. And then Matt's like, Moonlight Graham. It's like, let me tell you about Adam Greenberg, blah, 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 blah. So he called a contact that I knew at ESPN and got my number, called me up and was like, Hey, I want to do a, uh, I want to transcend sports. I want to get you back to the big leagues and whatever. And I'm listening to this guy. I'm like, whatever, like whatever, dude. But what I heard in his voice was the passion that I talk about all the time. Everything that I do, be passionate, good things will happen. And just don't quit until you get what you want. Um, or you'll find a new pathway to something else. So that's what he did. I said, buddy, knock yourself out. I said, I'm not playing independent ball anymore, but get me to spring training or whatever. You're no different than an agent. So go do whatever you want to do. Um, but I'm not a mockery. Don't, don't make me out as a mockery. Like I was a big leaguer and I want to get back and play. So that's how it started. And he 
really changed my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When, like, when did it, like, when did you find out that the Marlins were going to give you one at bat and like, what, uh, like how, what was the time period? Like what, how many days was it before that they were like, so did they tell you like a month before or did they tell you like a couple of days? Yeah. So, uh, the campaign started, as I mentioned, the off season going into 2012, I, di- I didn't play that year and I knew the team Israel was having a team. So I needed to stay in shape and ready just in case that happens. So that ended up happening. Had me come down to Florida. I w- went and met with my hitting coach for the first time in years since I had shoulder surgery. He fixed my swing in two hours. I was back to feeling like a big leaguer, went down to the team Israel camp, made the team world baseball classic qualifying tournament. I'm like, if I play well, we win, we go to the classic in March world stage. I play well, I go to a team, right? That was, that was how my mind was, was working. So Matt was down there with the film crew. Uh, Last game ended, we lost to Spain in the championship, which don't even ask, but I went into the clubhouse for the last time in my mind, like my career is over. And, and I really, it was a hard kind of time. Uh, Cause at that point I, I didn't see the pathway to anything. And I walked out of the clubhouse after Matt called me 50 times. And I'm like, dude, I don't want to do an interview. I'm not in a good mood, but mm-hmm. I'll be courteous and, and do one, but you know, I'm just not going to fake it. So his phone rings at 1130 at night on Sunday night. And it's David Sampson, the president of the Marlins. And he passed me the phone and he's like, listen, we were there seven years ago when you got hit. We thought you were okay. Your story came to our attention. We've sent our scouts. We've been watching everything that you, you've been doing. So like I was being scouted by them at this World Baseball Classic. And he's like, you were a big leaguer seven years ago and you're going to get another shot. You're going to get in that bat with us October 2nd or whatever. So I don't know the exact date, if it was mm-hmm. a week or whatever, but it was days that I couldn't say anything to friends or yeah teammates nothing so i went to new york city and went on the today show with matt lauer sat on the couch and my life changed forever yeah yeah i mean that's 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 crazy you got to just keep it a huge secret obviously that's a big secret um yeah. and then what yeah what was it like what was the feeling like just to get back there and then um just get in the batter's box again and then uh and then face the cy young award winner r.a dickey yeah, add the knuckleballer to that, yeah. right? Um, I mean, it, it was it was magical. It was it was an experience and a day and a, and a moment that I'll live. It'll live on with me forever. Um, you know, putting on the uniform again, being in a big league clubhouse, being treated like a big leaguer. Uh, I had some former teammates with the Royals or whoever that uh, stood up and and spoke on my behalf while I was there in the clubhouse just that we'll call it vouching for me to some degree like he was a big leader this is not a show this is not like yeah. like billy crystal getting in a bat right this yeah. is this is a guy who is one of us and that's how i was treated and i had to do some stupid dance in a speedo in front of everyone and like i was razzed and and it but it was it was it was great and i got to shag fly balls and i'm like man this is home like i i felt I felt alive, really. And in, I think it was the sixth inning or whatever it was, I, I went to pinch hit and 30,000 people standing ovation, cheering, one at bat, holding up these signs. The ground was shaking. And I'm like, I didn't just jump in to the batter's box right away. I stepped in, I was listening. I felt it. I'm like, I'm getting out of here. I'm, li- I'm letting it rain. I'm, I'm going to soak it in because I, I, I struggled for so many years and I'm like, if this only lasts three pitches or one or whatever, I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. So uh, yeah. And then facing RA Dickey, Cy Young award winning, led the league in strikeouts that year, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, whatever, yeah. part of the yeah. course, here yeah. we go. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Then going, going out of baseball, like tell me about uh, your entrepreneurial ventures. I know you started them while you were in the minor leagues <laughs> and things like that. So what, and what like made you do that? Like, what made you have like that, I guess, intuition to like start your post career while you were in the minors? Well, I mean, dating back to like childhood, I had a a personal services business. I would clean cars, clean garages, 
we you know, do landscaping, anything to mm -hmm. make some money. Um, but when I was playing as quickly as things came, as quickly as things went, right? And, and I knew that, and just living, I don't want to call it in poverty, but living yeah. on a shoestring that much, it sucked. So yeah. I always had aspirations for bigger and, and better. Um, so I started getting involved in real estate. Uh, I was doing pre foreclosures in certain cities. I would negotiate with the bank. I would deal with the homeowner. I would save them from foreclosure and, you know, meet people who had cash to buy houses. I mean, so that was something that I did and it helped keep me afloat, certainly. Um, and then the nutrition business that I started, it was because I had people that helped me really get back on the field and get healthy. So I wanted to give back. Um, and that was the birth of my nutrition business. And so, yeah, I started it while I was playing ball in Bridgeport mm -hmm. in the clubhouse. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I just always had that entrepreneurial spirit to say, and, um, and, and baseball was my passion. And I was able to learn so much through sports and baseball and just started kind of transitioning some of my energy and attention um, into, into some other entrepreneurial ventures. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And now I know you're um, director of sales for Chandler bats. And then I, I saw you been doing some analyst work too. So what is, what has that been like transitioning kind of like into new roles? I'd say. Yeah, it was cool because for, for 10 years, I was kind of out of baseball and it wasn't intentional. It wasn't like I had a ill will or anything yeah. like that. Um, I didn't want to get back on a bus and travel all over. Um, but I knew I at some point wanted to be back around the game. So I built my nutrition business. I sold it after 10 years and Chandler bats called and I had an opportunity. The, they were, uh, the company was actually in bankruptcy at the time. So they looked at me to help bring them out. Um, and did that successfully and went from director of sales to CEO of Chandler to ESPN, ACC network, uh, analyst. So all out 10 years, all back in. Um, okay. and it's, it, it's been great. So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. What is it? I know you, I know you've been a motivational, motivational speaker. So what, what is it, what is it like? What's the difference is like to just go on like TV and be an analyst? Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of similar. I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, I get to call the game and talk about the intricacies so it's not oh ground ball shortstop and he flips it over to a short you know second <laughs> whatever like it's it's talking about like what goes into the plays what's about to happen why certain things happen what you're looking at I mean just really analyzing the game itself and having fun in the process because at the end mm -hmm. of the day we're supposed to be entertainment for the viewers educational and entertaining so. When I go up and do motivational speaking, I mean, I'm trying to engage and get people interested and excited. So it's just taking that same kind of a, approach and make it where you're talking to somebody directly and 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 bringing them in to what you're doing. So I I, I genuinely like that side of it. It's it's been awesome yeah. and connecting with the players and coaches and doing some interviews and whatnot. It's it's, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I'm I'm sure you've seen a lot of changes in the ACC just with like the fields and everything that since you've been there. No, uh, teams, field, yeah. yeah, I think it's different. It's awesome. <laughs> um, what, what advice would you give to uh, a young athlete or a young baseball player? Oh, uh, loaded question. But it, advice is just if you, if you want to play at whatever level, go for it. Um, understand there's going to be hurdles and obstacles and plow through them, right? And, and just never stop, never quit. And I mean, the book that I wrote, get up, like the art of perseverance, just get up no matter what, because the value, the lessons that you learn from that or that you take away and the impact that you have on other people, it's, it's way bigger than just that moment. So um, if you want something, go get it and you know, go as far as you can. And if, if you make it awesome, if you don't, it's not a fail as long as you gave it everything you got. Yeah, for sure. All right. You ready for the last questions, the fun questions? Let's do it, man. All right. What well, uh, what was your favorite? Who was your favorite player and team growing up? Uh, Yankees and Don Mattingly. That's why the uh, the first baseman and the big Hoover love. <laughs> I got. You never got to wear twenty three though, right? 
Uh, when I was young, young. Yeah. yeah. When I was young, never. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. After, after 13, I got the number five handed to me because Greenberg was G fifth in line with alphabetical. So I was <laughs> five and Hank, Hank Greenberg, the, the famous yeah. tiger was five. So everyone's like, Oh, is that your grandfather? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> well, Hank Greenberg was my grandfather, just not the Hank Greenberg. So they would ask me and I'd be like, yeah. I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah. Did he play baseball? I was like, yeah. The Hank Greenberg? I'm like, no. <laughs> that's funny uh what do you like to do in your free time free time uh do i i don't know if i have any more um, i got three kids i know it took me like a month to get you on here so yeah dude, my, bad. <laughs> my bad um i don't know I, I i i love my kids i love spending time with them playing sports um we do a lot of i, I love fishing clamming crabbing berry picking i mean anything that's outdoors um that involves them and stuff that i used to do when i was young it's that that's that's what makes me happy all right last one did you get any itch to come out of retirement and try to play for team israel for the olympics uh of course yeah and then they never called <laughs> <laughs> i always told them like i said hey i'd be i'll be a coach and then they agreed and they're like all right well we'll bring you on as coach and then my whole thought was I'll be a player coach because yeah. might as well. Um, and it, it never happened. And I, I mean, whatever. I, yeah. I feel physically like I could go play tomorrow. Um, yeah. But then I always say like, yeah, but give me about like six months of training to play. And then yeah. I'll need another six months to so I'm like, yeah, it's, it, my, yeah. Time has, my time has come. <laughs> yeah, because I just had, I actually just had Josh uh, Zidon. So we were talking because he came out of retirement to to play yeah. for them. I mean, yeah, but I, he, I know he's a little he retired that long ago. How long did yeah, yeah, he yeah. retire? In three like, three years. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> eight, eight years ago or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. and he's a pitcher. All they do is throw. Yeah. I had to run. And hit and you can tell him I said that yeah. too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Then I mean, it was cool though, just to see baseball back in the Olympics. Also, just um, yeah. and like all the U.S. I mean, it was cool. It was cool and not cool that the the mlb didn't let the mlb players go yeah then we would have won probably so agreed yeah <laughs> agreed but anyways a pleasure having you as always uh yeah, and buddy. could you let the could you let the listeners know where they can follow you on social media yeah adam greenberg 10 on uh twitter and facebook is just adam greenberg you'll find me at, i don't know i either got my kids or or me um and then Instagram, I think, is the same, Adam Greenberg 10. But, you know, hit me up, hit Paul up, uh, check out Chandler Bats, and check me out on ESPN. This episode has been brought to you by BUSR.com. Go check it out to get your free $100 bet when you deposit $100 at BUSR.com slash Paul. 